It's funny because this morning on the way here, you know, it's about 45, 50 minutes uh, from Kailua, uh, you know, to drive here. And uh, my wife was asking me about something at work. And I was explaining to her something that I did. And I'm an engineer. You know, I'm a computer guy. And I was explaining to her this very technical thing I was working on. And she just looks at me and nods. And, and finally she goes, can you just tell me, can you just sum it up for me in an easier way to understand? And I said, it was broken and I made it work. <laughs> right? But I was, I was thinking about that sitting down. You know, when the, when the brother was singing the song, you know, sometimes we overcomplicate the gospel. We make it too hard for people to understand. And, and one of the things that, that I've learned as a technical person is I have to explain to non-technical people in a way that they understand. They don't want to hear all the details about how, how I spent three days working on this thing. All they want to know is what it can do for them and that it works. That's it. And the gospel is the same way. And I was thinking about this. And I was thinking, you know, there is a time and a place for a deep study of the Bible. There is a time to study etymology. There's a time to study history. There's a time to study, um, you know, different schools of thought. But Christ never once gave a message where he, got, he went into what the word means in Latin or Aramaic. He made it simple. He made the gospel very simple. I don't need to know what love means in three different languages to know that Jesus loves me. Because I know that He loves me because He's blessed my life. Like the brother said, He, he gets me a house. He takes care of the job. He makes sure that I have a, a family, that my family's healthy. He blesses me with salvation. I don't need a, a deep study again in, 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 in Latin or Hebrew or whatever to tell me that. I know from his example already. And I think when we communicate the gospel that we would be well served to communicate it in an easier to understand way because we Adventists, we tend to, we tend to bludgeon a little bit sometimes uh, with facts and details and, and, and prophecies and stuff. And, and that's all good. There's a time and place for that. But you know, the person that's struggling with addiction or the person that's struggling with, with just, does anybody love me? Right? They don't need all those details up front. They just need to know that there's a Savior that loves them and wants to help them. And the easier we, that we can communicate that, I think the better results we'll have. Um, but I'm going to start out with this. Um, that was just my, my preface here. How many of you actually have a person that you would die for? Raise your hand if you got somebody. That if somebody came in here right now with a weapon and said, I'm going to kill somebody, and you said, don't take this person, take me instead. Everybody's got at least one person, right? <clears throat> at least one person. And it's typically somebody that's close to you. And I'd say immediately my wife, my kids. There might be an expanded, like my mother, my sister, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, but typically, would you, it, would you agree with me that it's a short list? Right? Now, if they came in and said, you know, I'm going to kill so-and-so who you barely know, am I going to step up and say, no, take me? Right? I'll tell you, I'll tell you person, excuse me, take my life instead of theirs. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the, the love of people. How, how does God want us to love people? If you would turn with me to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. It always amazes me when I read stories about people being kind or putting themselves in harm's way for strangers. One of the most amazing stories I ever heard was there was a, a on the subway in New York, if you, if you guys have ever visited, you know, you, you go underground and, and you have these trains constantly coming in and out. And there's no... There's no really um, guardrail or anything between you and the train. You can just jump straight off the, you know, where you wait for the train, right onto the tracks. And New York is not known for its aloha. Let's be honest. All right, they have their own version of aloha. But, but anyways, this kid fell onto the train tracks, and this stranger 
knowing that the train's going to be there any second, jumps onto the train tracks, grabs this kid, and hugs him and just ducks down as the train passes over. Now that takes some bravery right there. How do you know that that train's going to clear you? That you're even going to make it, right? But it was just a random person that saw this kid in, in desperate need that was going to die and he said, I need to do something about it. It was a complete stranger. And stories like this happen so many times and it blows my mind that you could put yourself in danger, that you could possibly give up your life for someone you don't even know. That you could have that kind of compassion, that you would act in a moment's notice without even time to think to help somebody out. Are you guys at Exodus 32? Yes. Okay. Exodus 32, starting with verse 1. Now, I'm going to read pretty much the entire chapter, so bear with me. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who has brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off your golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them and I will make, you, make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent, from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm from which He would do to His people, and Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder. And he scattered it on the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? So Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. 
As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and this fire came out. Now when Moses saw the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them, to their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And about 3,000 men of, of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that He may bestow upon you a blessing this day. For every man has opposed his son and his brother. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, give these, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now therefore go lead this people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. Now the message title is, Blot Me Out. Blot Me Out. Now I want to break down this this, uh, this story here with some observations. And one of the first things I want to talk about is Moses actually got to spend time with God. Alone time with God, with, in the very presence of God. Now we know historically that God once walked amongst us before man fell. And so when God walked in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, they actually had conversations with Him face to face. They got to meet and, and talk to their Creator. They got to walk. And they got to have conversations about who knows what. And this is the only recorded time since then that we've actually had someone in the presence of God. And not only was He in the presence of God for a day, He was in the presence of God for 40 days. And we know that after this, He wrote the law. He wrote the books of Moses is what they call it. So God implanted in him all the things that he wanted to accomplish with his people. So Moses is coming down from this mountain with this, on a spiritual high, glowing with the light of God, with the things that God has implanted in his mind, right? Now have you ever had an experience, a glimpse of, of God in person? Ever? Just a small glimpse usually, right? Never 40 days straight. I've had times in prayer where I felt the presence of God and it just lifted me up. I can't imagine 40 days straight. I feel like I could run, I could fly, right? So Moses, I'm sure, is having a good time with the Lord. And as he's walking down the mountain, he is carrying the law of God. So God actually writes with his own finger, his own hand, the law that he wants Moses to give to his people. Now the funny thing is, you know, I, I talk a lot about this, but because I, I grew up, I did not grow up Adventist, but our fellow Protestants teach that the law was nailed to the cross. And I always ask this question. There's only one thing in the history of mankind that God wrote himself. He did not trust the angels or prophets or anybody else. Even Moses didn't write it. He did it himself. And he wrote it on stone. Right? It's the only thing we know that he wrote on stone. And so if God is perfect, and everything he does is perfect, everything he writes is perfect, everything he says is perfect, 
Why would he nail that to the cross? Why would he nail his perfect law to the cross? It makes no sense. And that's because they misinterpret what Paul said. But here Moses has the most important message ever given to mankind. Straight from the Lord Himself. And as he's walking down the mountain, what does he see? Well, he hears it first. And he knows it's not war. That's what Joshua says. But actually, I would say it, it, maybe it was a war. There was a spiritual warfare going on that Israel was losing. They had given in to idolatry. You know, they had been under subjection for the Egyptians for so long. Right? They were under the Egyptian gods and they, they were, you know, kind of like if you look at our churches, I always, always find it amazing that most of the time our churches reflect the community more than they reflect Christ. It's because the world has such an effect on God's people sometimes. And so Moses had just delivered the Israelites from physical bondage. They had been under subjection to Pharaoh for 400 years. All they had known is toil and misery. And Moses had delivered them. Right? He was, the, he was the spokesman for God and God parted the sea. They saw all these wonderful things that God had done for them to deliver them. And what do they do? As soon as they think Moses is not coming back, what do they do? Yes, they made false gods out of gold. They made false gods out of gold. So here they had left bondage only to return to bondage. Now they may not have been under physical bondage. They may have been physically free to walk about as they wanted in the desert. But now they're under spiritual bondage. Because now they're making gold calves and saying this is our God. So they're actually doing more like the Egyptians than what God wants them. Now, what is sad about the story is, is that the high priest, which was who? Aaron. The high priest was complicit in the idolatry. So he didn't even say, you know what, I, I don't really want to be part of this. You guys want to fashion a calf and do it, that's on you. I don't want nothing to do with it. What does he say to him? Give me the gold. I'm going to build it for you. Right? So their leaders, the people that were trusted to lead the people while Moses was away, the high priest, his own brother, turns and helps them commit this great sin. And so Moses is coming down the mountain and he sees this. And he has this, these two stones that have God's handwriting on it. Again, the most important message of that time. The most important thing God ever wrote. And he's so disappointed in his people. He's so frustrated that they turned so quickly. That they, they turned out to, you know, to be idolaters. And they involved not only themselves, but they involved the people who were supposed to watch over them. The high priest, his brother. And what does he do with the tablets? He throws them. He breaks them. Why does he break them? He say these people don't deserve this message. They don't deserve the law of God. Right? And so he was confronted with this sin and he became very angry. Now, is it sinful to be angry? Should Moses have been angry? Yes. Now this shows you the relationship that Moses and God had. Because God gave him those tablets to give to the people and he breaks them. Right? So God understands why he's angry. And what does he do with the golden calf? I love this part. This is one of my favorite parts of this story. What's he do to it? He breaks it and does what else to it? He grinds it up, make, makes them drink it. He's like, you guys want to idle here? Here's what it tastes like. Well, what, what object lesson was Moses trying to do with this? He wanted them to taste the bitterness of sin. I don't know if you've ever drank gold. 
<laughs> I've been to a lot of a lot of places, a lot of sinful places. I've never heard of a gold drink. All right, I, I can imagine it's not very, you know, it's not good for your digestion. But the point is, is he wanted them to feel the the. The, the bitterness. He wanted them to taste the bitterness of their sin because they didn't understand. They were ignorant of these things. He's like, this is where this is going to lead to. It's going to lead to bitterness and death. And so Moses obviously is frustrated with his people. But he tells Aaron something that's very interesting. He says, I'm going to go back up to God because of this great sin and I'm going to do what for them? I'm going to make atonement for them. Even though he was frustrated, even though he said, he actually called the people up and said, who's on God's side? And he actually had them kill those who were involved in some of these things. He still loved them so much, he said, I'm going to go back up the mountain and I'm going to talk to God and I'm going to see if I can make atonement for them. And if you remember what he said to God, now let's, let's just read it. It says, Then Moses returned to the Lord. Now this is verse 31. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, All these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray... Blot me out of your book which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now therefore, go lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Now Moses goes to God. And in this story, the only one who's been righteous, the only one who's been obedient, the only one who has done what God has asked him to is Moses. But yet he goes to God and says, if you're not going to forgive these people, then count me among them. Count me as one of them. Charge me with the sin that they have committed and blot me out of your book. Now what book is he talking about? The book of life. He's saying, take my name out. He loves his people so much that he is willing to say, take me too. Count me among them, even though I don't deserve it, even though I have been faithful, even though I have been obedient, even though I've done all the things that you've asked me to do. I don't want to see them lost. And if they're going to be lost, then you might as well place me with them and take me out of your book. Yes, yes. And I'm getting to that, Mel. That's a good point. Now it's one thing to say I'll die for my brother Aaron who got caught up in the crowd or maybe my wife or my kids or my good friends. It's quite another to say I want to die for the people I don't know. I want to die for the person who helped fashion the golden idol. I want to die for the person who was blaspheming the Lord at the base of the Lord's mountain. You know, this was, in the, this was in the presence of the Lord. This wasn't like they were in some dark corner or some bar someplace or some, some hidden basement away from the crowd. They did it openly right at the base of the mountain that God was talking to Moses. Right in the very presence of the Lord. Now that's blasphemy, friends. But yet Moses loves them so much that he'll die from the person he knows best to the person he knows the least. Now who does this remind you of? Jesus. 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 The Bible is so full of typologies. Typologies, which means that there are, there are uh, almost like templates where you have, like in this case, Moses is a type of Christ. He uses the word atonement. Now the thing is, did God take him up on that? Did Moses have to die for his people? No. No, he did not. But he was willing to. He was willing to. Just like Abraham. 
Did God want Abraham to kill Isaac? No. What did he want from Abraham? To be willing to give up his son. Again, that was a typology. That was saying, you have to have the same heart as I do for the people. You have to be willing to give your son as an atonement. Now if you guys would turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Let's talk about Jesus. Starting with verse 26. And I love this. And one of the reasons I love this, this verse is it, is it explains prophetically <clears throat> what happened to Israel. Just say amen when you're there. Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. What does it mean to be Abraham's seed? What nation do you belong to? Where does your citizenship lie? Israelite. You're Israelite. Now see, we understand this and we preach this as Adventists. Because our, our brothers and sisters in our, in our other Protestant churches, they teach that Israel as a literal nation. But we know what the Bible says, that Israel is a spiritual nation now. Because we know that at Christ's death, when Israel had apostatized to the point that they murdered the Savior, now I'm talking about the literal nation of Israel, okay, that was under subject to the Romans. We know that the stoning of Stephen, that probation ended for them. And we know that in AD 70, the Romans ransacked the temple and destroyed it. And that was the end of literal Israel. Now there's a nation of Israel now, but that's not the same as the nation of Israel the Bible refers to. Because now it's a spiritual nation. So all those of us who have accepted Christ are now Abraham's seed. In other words, we are counted as, we are adopted. It taught, the Bible talks about you know, the vine that's grafted in. That's, that's who we are now. We have been given a heritage that we don't deserve as Gentiles. right? Because we've accepted it through faith. And God said, because of your faith, I will count you as an Israelite. I will count you as the seed of Abraham. Now, one of the things, you know, I have my own pet peeves. One of the things that I think we get wrong a whole lot of times is when we point to people, and I'll just ask you this point blank. Is everybody on this planet a child of God? You say yes. Who says yes? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to disagree with you. And I'll, say, and I'll tell you why. It says, For you are all sons of God through faith. Through faith in Christ Jesus. This verse explains what a child of God is. If you are a sinner, you are not a child of God. Why is that? It's because you've chosen not to be. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he says, I know your father. Your father is who? The devil. The devil. So, we have to make this, this very clear. Sinners who have not accepted Christ are, no, are not children of God. Only those who have accepted Christ are children of God. Unfortunately, sinners who do not accept Christ have accepted the heritage of who? Satan. Just like we've accepted through faith Christ, we are considered Abraham's seed. When you are a sinner and had not accepted Christ, you are a son of who? It's sad, but it's true. So when you look at someone who has not accepted Christ, they are not a child of God. That's our job. That's our job is to tell them about the heritage that they're missing out on. That they have a father. 
that's ready to adopt them, that's ready to forgive them, ready to treat them like the princess or prince that they are, the son of the living God, the son of the Most High. But they won't have that heritage if they don't accept Christ. Does that make sense, guys? Amen. If you guys would turn me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. I want to read the verse again that, that uh, Sister Melanie read. And this is the prophet talking about Christ's mission. Talking about what Christ was going to do for the sinner. Isaiah 53.12. Let's say amen when you're there. Amen. amen. I notice some of you are faster than others. I'm not very good with the paper. Yeah, I'm, good. I'm better with the phone. Uh, probably because my eyes are getting bad. I don't know. Okay, verse 12 says, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And I want to talk a little bit about Jesus. And I want to compare Jesus to Moses. And how similar they were in their love for their people. Now did Jesus spend time with God before His ministry started? We, got, we know the story. He spent time where? In the wilderness. The desert. Right? He goes out into the desert, just like Moses and the Israelites were in the desert, right? So he spent time with God, and at the end, end of that, as he's preparing for his ministry, to start his ministry, what happens to Jesus at the very end of that? Remember, he fasted for 40 days? He was tempted, right? What was he tempted with? What's one of the things he was tempted with? The last thing that, that, that the devil tried to get him with? To jump off. But why did he ask him to do that? So, the crux of the, of the temptations was really about worship. Right? If you are the Son of God... He was questioning the very fact that he was the Son of God. But if you remember, one of the temptations was, I will give you all these kingdoms. Remember that? So just like the Israelites, Jesus was tempted in the same way with idolatry. But the difference between Jesus and the Israelites is the Israelites gave into it. They said, build us a calf. They even gave up their gold. They gave up their riches to build a calf. What, how did Jesus handle that? When the devil came to him, what did, what did he do? How did he respond? With the Word of God. With the Word of God. If you ever wonder why Moses didn't want to give the, the tablets to the Israelites, it's because of that. Right? The precious Word of God. If you're just going to trample it, if you're just going to throw it away, why would I give it to you? If you ever wondered why we fail sometimes spiritually, that's, that's the reason. If God can't trust you with what He gave you, why would He trust you with more? We've talked about this before. It's sad. So many people live, live lives that are, they, they, they are constantly in defeat because God can't trust them with more light. Because the light He's given them, they don't do good with it. So just like, just like Moses, Jesus also came to free us from bondage. Right? Now, God always picks some time and places for reasons. We talk about typology. Now, we know that the literal nation of Israel was under physical bondage to the Romans. But they were also under spiritual bondage. So, very similar situation to them being under Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh at the time was the most powerful nation on the earth. And during Jesus' time, the Romans were the most powerful nation on the earth. And what Jesus came to do is say, is say, you need to be set free spiritually first this time. Then the physical bondage will leave. The Romans will be kicked out if you fulfill your mission, which is to be the light of the world. 
So if you accept the Savior, if you accept the Scripture, if you accept my sacrifice, the Romans won't need to be around anymore. Remember, they got it reversed. They thought Jesus would come in with an army. The Messiah would come in with an army and overthrow the Romans. And what Jesus was preaching was, you are in spiritual bondage. You are subject to the devil. And I'm here to free you from that. And if I free you spiritually, then the physical bondage will also, you'll be free. And they didn't understand that. Just like Moses, Christ came with the commandments in hand. A lot of people say that Christ did away with the commandments. No, He expanded them. You remember He said, as it is written, it's not okay to have you know, commit adultery. And He says, but I tell you, any man that looks at a woman lustfully, He expanded it. He's saying not only is the act wrong, but thinking of the act is wrong. Because in your heart if you sin, even if you don't manifest that in an action, you still have committed sin. You remember the verse that says, if you love me, keep my commandments? Keep my commandments? He was re reiterating what God had already written. And so just like Moses, his, one of his missions was is to give the Word of God to the people again. Now the Israelites had been under bondage of, of Pharaoh, so they'd been under the influence of a secular, you know, pagan government for 400 years. So they had all this paganism, you know, in their culture. The problem with Israel during the time of Christ's day was they weren't preaching it right at the temple. Now not only did they have the influence of the Romans, they also didn't have a good influence. They couldn't go to the temple and get the message that they were supposed to get. Now it's getting that way now. As the world progresses more and more, we will see more of this. We will not be able to go in our own churches and hear it straight. You guys have already heard preachers and pastors and denominations. You know, we're no longer a subject under the sovereign God. We are, we are more a democracy. Whatever the people want to hear. Whatever tickles their ear, whatever warms their belly, whatever puts them to sleep, that's what they want to hear. And more and more pastors, more and more denominations, even within our own denominations, don't want to preach the Word of God as it was given to us, as it, as it is written. They want to give it to the people as they want to hear it. Don't disturb the people too much. Don't wake them up from their sleep. And we know where that comes from. And so Jesus brings this Word of God, and what does it do? How do the people react? You've got people who are, who are in sin and people who are hurting and are, are despised and are rejected and are lonely and lost. And they love it. You mean someone loves me? Someone wants to heal me? You had people that had been sitting on the steps of the temple for years that no one cared about, no one bothered to talk to, no one wanted to, to heal. And Jesus says, stretch out your hand. Let me make you whole. They hear of this, this God that they had never heard before. But the problem in Jesus' time, just as in the time with Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai, is that the church was complicit in these things. The high priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the scribes were all complicit in these things. They were not given the message as God had intended. And so instead of a God of love, a God of mercy, and a God of justice, they got a God that was exacting, of toil, a mean God that despised the poor. They looked down upon the sick. The leper was cast out. And so Jesus came to say, no, that's not the God that is. The God that is is a God that loves a God that heals, a God that saves. And so Jesus had the same issue. He had people that just didn't understand what God was trying to do. Now did Jesus get angry and confront sin? Just like Moses. Moses came down from the mountain and saw what was going on and he took the tablets and said, 
Now look, we make Jesus, and I've said this, you've heard me several times say this, we make Jesus too passive. We made Jesus to be a Jesus that's, that wasn't gritty. You know, remember, he, he was a, a, a carpenter. He probably had gnarled hands, you know. I mean, he, he, was, he was a man's man. All right? I see these depictions of him. We make him more feminine. We make him more, you know, not that there's anything wrong with femininity. But to take our Savior, we make him into this passive, like, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm just here to listen. Is this the same Jesus that was kicking over tables and cracked his whip? No, because he had righteous indignation. He had a right to be angry. He had to let the people know this is not okay. You cannot treat the temple like this. You cannot treat God's house like this. You can't rob the poor in God's house. You shouldn't rob the poor anyways. But especially in God's house. So just like Moses, Jesus got angry when he saw the sin and he saw the people doing things that were contrary to his word and contrary to his mission. And he let them know about it. And just like Moses, Jesus wanted to, the people to see the bitterness of sin. He wanted, to see, he wanted to show them this is where it leads. It leads to death and destruction. It leads to subjugation. Right? They wondered why the Romans were still occupying Israel. Again, you go back to the spiritual warfare. God would have delivered them if they had just submitted to God. But they didn't. You know, my wife and I were talking this week about government. And if you look at the history of all government, throughout the history of the world, no matter how well intended or how well put together it is, it always ends up the same. A dictatorship. Every single time. We see it in America. We were set up as best as any, any could hope for. And we see the news tightening you guys have noticed. It's tightened because as the people get more and more corrupt and more and more evil, the laws get more and more oppressive. That's just the way it is. And this is what we don't understand sometimes as Americans is that if we would spiritually submit to God, God would free us from oppression. Right? From physical oppression. But the Israelites rejected God, rejected Christ. And what happened? Not only were they lost spiritually, but they lost their literal nation too. And God is so long-suffering, even after Christ was murdered on the cross, He still gave them time to get it right. He was still desperately trying to save them. And just like Moses, Jesus wanted to make atonement for His people Israel. But the difference between Moses and Jesus is Moses could not have died for His people. And why is that? Why is that? The same reason an angel couldn't die for us. Only a person with life in them, a life giver, can die for us. This is, why, this is why God did not take up Moses on his, because Moses' sacrifice for atonement wouldn't have been enough. As well intended as it was, and God loved Moses' heart and his, in his, you know, his want to love, love his people and want to be counted among his people. But only Christ had the power to be enough for a sacrifice for our atonement. And of course He did. He died for us. And so, Christ made intercession for us. And this is one of the reasons that He came to this earth. Because now where is He? He became our high priest. He became our high priest. Now, He's not a Levite. and you know That's a whole other story. But the point is, is that He came here and was among us. And was counted as among us and had the same deficiencies as us. And died for us so that He could go up and be an intercession for us. So not only did He make this sacrifice, 
Right? If you go back to the temple, not only was he the sacrifice, he's also the priest. So he takes care of all the temple duties. Isaiah 43, 25-26 says this, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together, state your case, that you may be acquitted. Christ actually took the penalty for our sins. He was blotted out. He was blotted out. He took our penalty. He took the death penalty that was supposed to come to us and He took it upon Himself. He also took all the shame, all the guilt, all those things. All those things that should have been attributed to us. He took it. And why did He take it for us? Because He loved us. Because He loved us. Thank you, Brother Mel. Because He loved us. He loved us so much. It says, while you were yet sinners... He died for us. In other words, why you rejected Him? Why were you... The, the same time you were being a knucklehead, that's when He died for you. If you would turn with me to John, I'm going to close with this. John chapter 15, verse 12. We should know this one, but just in case. John chapter 15, starting with verse 12. This talks about the, the type of love that we're to have for one another. It says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now his command is this, that we love one another, right? Self-explanatory. But he tells us how we can love one another. So he clarifies what love means in that context. And that's when he says the greatest love is of one dying, laying down his life for his friend. In other words, dying for someone else. Willing to step in the place of someone else. And the reason this is important, the reason we talked about Moses and the reason we've talked about Jesus today is this is what He wants of us. He wants us to love each other so much that we're willing to die for one another. And friends, it may come to that, believe it or not. We've, we know prophecy. We t we've talked about it our whole lives. It may come to that. It may come to that. But the greatest love is one laying down his life for his friends. Now, did Christ lay down his life for his friends and his enemies? Everybody. And it further clarifies who his friends are. It says, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Which means effectively obedience. Right? If you do what I ask you to do, then you're my friends. It inspires me to see... Now, we know about Jesus, and we know that He loves us, but it inspires me to see other people in the Bible that were willing to, to put away their own life for the love of others, for the love of their people. Right? And as we close today, I just want to reiterate, this is the type of love God wants us as Christians to have. That we go to God on their behalf, even people that don't like us, people that, that are mean to us, and say, Lord, if it's possible, put it upon me. Put it upon me. To go to God for your wife or your kids or your church or someone you know and say, God, I know they're not living right. If you've got to take somebody, take me. Don't take them. That's the kind of love God wants us to have. Now we know, friends, we can't have that on our own. I don't have that kind of love inside me naturally. But through Christ, who gave the example already, and with His help, we can love one another that way. Right? Amen. I would encourage this congregation to seek the Lord in prayer and ask Him to give us that kind of love for one another. And we can start right here in our congregation. 
Say, Lord, help us to love one another so much in how old the church that if somebody came in and said, I'm shooting somebody, that all of us would raise our hands and say, take me. Take me. Right? I think that would be a great example to the community, to each other. Right? I'll close with that. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the examples of your word, the examples of your son. We ask that you give us the type of love uh, for one another, um, that we'd be willing to die, that we'd be willing to say, Lord, put it on me. Put their punishment, put their sin upon me, but just don't take them. Count me as a transgressor. Lord, only you have that kind of love, and only you can put that kind of love in our heart. So I ask that you lift us up and, and fill us with that kind of love, Father. In your name we pray. Amen.